that if you're in marketing, go on a sales call every week with your best and your worst salespeople. Learn something from the field. Bring it back to your marketing and understand why people buy things. Understand the language they use when they talk about the problem or your product. And I think that will completely change your perspective on creating collateral or outreach. Hello and welcome to Confessions of a B2B Marketer. My name is Tom, your host, and today we have some real talk. We have a seasoned salesperson. So as the typical guest on the show is normally someone within marketing, maybe personal branding, etc. Quite soft, maybe a little bit fluffy. We're all talking about how good marketing is and how good marketers are. But today we're going to bring on Robert Bolin. And Robert is going to talk about how we as marketers maybe need to be more accountable to revenue, why we need to attend sales calls and why we ideally need to have the same target number as the sales function. Now, before we get into that, just give a quick shout out to fame.so. We start and grow podcasts for B2B brands. If you want a show like this, yours would probably be better than this. Or maybe you'd have a better host than me. Go to fame.so, request a proposal, say that I send you and I will make sure the team will look after you very well. Let's jump into this episode with Robert now. Robert, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Would you describe yourself as a sales guy? Yeah, I would say that the majority of my enterprise career was in enterprise software sales, and that's where I made the most progress and speed with professional development. But I spent about a decade being in enterprise software sales, and then that parlayed into me starting a software company in Manhattan. And then I was the CEO of that company, which is like, when you're CEO of a startup company and then ultimately successfully sold that business last year in an acquisition, you wear a lot of hats. So that role of being an entrepreneur and starting your own company and then selling it, running it and then selling it is uh, jack of all trades. But my pure sales career in enterprise software sales was a solid decade that I was selling enterprise software. Sure. And the reason why we're chatting is because we actually met in the LinkedIn comments on a post. Well, I was probably extolling the virtue of marketing functions. And then you jumped in, you saying something along the lines of the fact that actually marketing functions need to be more commercial or be more like salespeople. Yeah, there's so much to unpack there, right? Because when you go to a sale, like most sales teams have an annual sales kickoff. So at the beginning of the year, they get everyone together, the company briefs them on new products. The company does X, Y, and Z, and everyone gets together and comes up with their sales plan, and then they go off and sell for the year. And most of the time, the CMO, the head of marketing, is there, and they kind of present numbers. They'll say, oh, we generated these many leads, and these are the marketing activities we did, or this is the trade shows we went to, and this is our new campaigns. But the things that they are not, like they're not held to the same standard as salespeople are, which they could be. Like salespeople have a number, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a number for the year, you have a quota for each quarter or whatever it may be. And if you don't do it, you're fired or you're put on an improvement plan, but you're basically fired. And salespeople are like really commercially driven, right? They're just like looking at the number all the time, trying to figure out how can they get the most amount of revenue or get the strategic customers or what have you. If salespeople had the same structure I think you would see different behavior. And you'd also so, probably see sales and marketing teams working together more. So let's just like forecast forward or let's just pretend we're running a business. We have the sales team. Sure. They're like, we're selling, let's say some live streaming software that is like your area. And let's say you're the CEO and I'm the CMO. And you come to me and you're like, look, this marketing function, it needs to be more like my, the sales function that I've built. We're right. going to do X, Y, Z. Well, what is X, Y, Z? So I think the first two things, or the first few things, because every time I say the first, first two, I mention five, right? I'll say like the two things, then I'll say five. But like the first things are, when's the last sales call that you went on? When's the last customer that you met in real life? When's the last time you went to the field with a salesperson? And if your answer is, I haven't, then we have a problem. And then the second thing is, show me what lead resulted in what revenue. Because that always is like a great conversation. Because they're like, well, we had a trade show and this person came in and then we networked to some other people. And then, oh, I don't know, we just got some magically got some business over here. 
B2B is not like ad tech, right? Ad tech, you run an ad on Instagram and then you can track it back to your e-commerce store and you can see the actual return on advertising spend. But B2B marketing is not like that, right? There's the halo effect and then there's all those other different pieces. So I would ask you to A, measure yourself, B, get in the field. And that, I saw some CMOs like, oh yeah, I went on a sales call. I'm like, no, you need to go on a sales call every week. Because there's so much that you can learn from that that will change your marketing. First of all, if you're out there in the field with a salesperson in front of a customer and you're listening to what the customer says, that's a whole part of this conversation I'm sure we're going to have. But that's one of the activities. So the two first questions I would ask is, hey, when's the last time I went on a sales call and show me the exact number of revenue that came from each lead? That way we can quantify. Totally with you on the first piece. And a weekly sales calls to the CMO understand that. Are we also, should we also prescribe that to the seven marketing resources in my team? No, I think maybe it's good for like the copywriter or maybe someone who's doing some other marketing work to go on a sales call once in a while. They're going to get exposure at things like trade shows. But if the marketing leader understands why the customer buys, and that's the thing that most marketing people always talk about, but they totally miss because they rarely are in front of customers. So everyone, you know, Simon Sinek is always start with why. And marketers always say, oh, start with why. But it's like, what are you doing? You're like, you're marketing this product. You're going to talk about this product and its features and its benefits. But that's not why someone actually buys it, right? You've got to go talk to them and say, well, who is our buyer? And why would they buy this? And most of the time in the enterprise, everyone kind of has a different reason. They're related, but... When you get into these companies, you'll find out like, oh, that's the reason why you're buying the software. It's totally different than why another company is buying that software. The second point you were talking about was having us prove or prove that this lead drives revenue and sure. giving us or me a number. So you're saying that if I don't hit, let's say my number is going to be pipeline generated in this financial year. Are you saying that if me as a CMO doesn't hit that goal, whether it's pipeline or revenue actually? I'm getting fired. Is that correct? Right. The compensation drives behavior, right? And that's how it's always been. Compensation drives behavior. So if you want movement in this one area, compensate in that area. So if I just compensate you on pipeline, I'll just end up having a shitty pipeline. It'll be like, oh, look at this big pipeline. And then it'll make my sales team look bad because they can't close a bunch of bad leads. No, you should share the same number that the sales team has. No artificial number. Because in different industries, like maybe you need a 4x pipeline, but like maybe in enterprise software sales, you just need a 1.5x pipeline. If you have good product market fit, you have good sales team, like they'll execute. My execution rate was way in the 90s. There was not many times I would get a lead and then not close it for some revenue. But mainly I was just disqualifying a lot of potential customers until I had that subset of customers that I knew that would buy. So... The marketing team should share in the sales team's number. If the sales team's number is 23 million, your number is 23 million. You got, you're in the same boat as they are. But that's usually the problem, right? Where the sales team looks at the marketing team, the sales team hates the marketing team, and the marketing team feels unappreciated. And it's always like that, that point of friction within the company. That's not what always is. It sounds like a simple solution. Like we have one revenue target and the marketing function and the sales function responsible for hitting it. But they're two separate. Most marketing teams are like, okay, we're going to go over here. We're going to do trade shows. We're going to build collateral. We're going to do the website. And it's, have you talked to a customer yet? No. Okay, go on a sales call a week with a sales, sales team member and talk to customers. And then come back. And then do all those things. Because the vernaculars change. One of the things that you'll notice is that like customers use different vernaculars when they're talking about your product. Like the way they describe their product or what they call it or how it functions within their company. You got to use those same words. So like one of the early sales guy tricks is you show up, you get in the conversation and somebody says something that may be technically incorrect, but that's the way they describe a process or your product. You use that same word. You mirror your customer. So if they call it a toaster oven, you call it a toaster oven, right? Like even if you're selling blenders, it's like, yeah, toaster oven. Like you don't, it's just, you want the product to fit into their world, right? You don't want them to have to learn new stuff to then understand your product. It just makes it more difficult. So learn the way that your customer speaks. Learn the reasons why they buy stuff. And then put that into your marketing because that's going to better connect with your customers. First of all, when you're looking for leads. But then also, 
there's a simple thing too. You need to fuel what feeds you and starve what doesn't. So if you go to trade shows and people are like, this show sucks. There's nobody here that we need to talk to or it's not the right fit. I have seen companies consistently go to the same trade shows over and over or invest. And trade shows are super expensive. Or do these marketing events that maybe don't produce, just don't do them again, right? Like sometimes marketing people want to do things just to look busy or to be active or be out in the market. It doesn't, it's not help. You got to only focus on things that feed you. A lot of activities will probably get thrown out of the window after we update this goal. To me now, it totally makes sense that, yeah, the sales and marketing team should have the same goal. At Fame, we actually call it a growth team and we have only one salesperson, to be fair, but then there's only one goal for the growth team, which is how many new clients we sign a month. So we have that. And so it makes sense to me. My question to you is, why haven't these two companies always done this and just have one goal for both of those teams? Yeah, I think the 10 years I spent in this enterprise streaming company, we had the best sales team ever. We had some talented people that worked in marketing. We had a few people that came in that were sharp. We had very bad executive leadership. Even though the company, like, I made a ton of money. I had a great career there. This was uh, Kumu, right? Yeah. The management team were just complete idiots. The CEO there, the CFOs, they were bad. They were truly bad. You know that TV show, The Office? You were there for nine years, so something must be yeah. going, right? I was making a lot of cash and I had a great, my immediate boss, and he was a great player coach. He was the best. He taught me everything. My team was amazing. Our sales team just well out executed the entire company completely. But if you look at the rest of the management team, it was that TV show, The Office, like a UK TV show, right? Basically yeah. faced with any decision, they always choose the wrong one. Like whatever the decision is, it's wrong. Right, They would just always choose the wrong. Given two choices, they choose the wrong one. Those functions were always separated. It was like marketing is here, finance is here, sales team is here. And so you had these natural silos in the company. So first of all, that silo approach is not cool. right? We all know that in modern companies today. It's like flat organization. Marketing should be able to work with sales as much as possible. And they, they should be hand in hand. Marketing and sales is, to me, the same thing. One's broadcasting the message out and one's executing on the message, bringing that to customers and executing it, right? It's the same thing. Like you're in the same boat. I don't know. I guess in the way people sometimes think about it on sales teams, they're like, oh, those are salespeople that can't hack it. Those are people that are not good enough to be salespeople. So they work in marketing. And you're like, ah, maybe I agree with that, but I've heard it a bunch. So it's maybe what that means is you're not willing to have a collar around your neck. Because salespeople live and die by the year, right? You don't make your number, you're fired, right? You don't make your number this quarter, you get kicked out. You're really tied to that number. But marketing people aren't tied to the same metric. If you fail at marketing, are you fired? Maybe. I don't know. It's kind of a gray area. Is it really cutthroat like that? If you had the same attitude for both of those teams, hey, maybe you'd see something different. I think you would. Did you have a marketing team? Him, it was Bunch, right? The company that you started and sold. We were really small, but we were a really effective group. We had a bunch of Fortune 500 customers. We generated revenue from customers that other companies couldn't get. No, we didn't have a marketing team. We did it all ourselves, right? We were a small enough team where we could do it all ourselves. But we invested in marketing. We invested in trade shows. We brought products to customers. We produced collateral. And that's one of the things where being in a smaller company or being the CEO of a scale-up, startup and then it was a scale up. We were a startup for two minutes because we generated half a million dollars of revenue like our first couple of months. And then it was like, whoa, we started moving. One of the things about doing that is that you just basically have to, you're like, wear all these different hats. You're just basically a jack of all trades and you have to do all these different things. One day you're doing the marketing, the next day you're doing the sales, the next day you're doing product development engineering. If you do all of those things, you get pretty good at marketing your product, right? Because not only do you technically know your product, but you know how it's sold, why people buy it, you know how they talk about it. And then when you go back to do the marketing collateral, it's, yeah, put your marketing hat and do it. If a marketing person, a marketing leader has that same exposure, do you think they'd be better or worse at their job? I'm totally in agreement. I'm trying to understand, did you do all the marketing activities a bunch or did you ever have anybody else do it? Oh, no, we had people work with us. I had a copywriter on staff. We had different people work on marketing, for sure. That's the name of a startup, right? Where we're like, yeah. you wear multiple hats, and then when you can't wear that hat anymore, you hire someone to do it, right? 
Here's my theory on startups and those kinds of things. Do the job once and then hire for it. Understand the job, at least do it. Like I did a bunch of our early copywriting and then I hired a copywriter. I did a bunch of our early graphic design, then I hired a graphic designer. Better way to ask that question for sure. Okay, and so those marketing resources that you did bring on, were they given a pay rise or were they fired if the business didn't hit the revenue goal? A lot of the times when we brought in like a copywriter, right? It was more of a part-time role. So a little different there. But yeah, definitely. We hired a group of designers. We had some graphic designers that just didn't execute effectively. We moved on. We got another group. Like we got another team member. So 100%. Like I brought people on and that's... Gary Vee always says that. He's like, fire fast. I wasn't going to try to make someone work in the role that they're not good at. I just found another resource. So yes. Makes total sense. And I was reading online somewhere that the sales motion you had for Bunch, I think you maybe you started off with like enterprise sales, but then you switched to like, oh, or maybe I'll ask that. But did you always have the enterprise sales motion for Bunch? So we were always enterprise. I think what changed for us was when COVID happened, we were in business for, I don't know, five years or so, and then COVID happened. And when COVID kicked off, it was it's really interesting about our business. We were very close to our customers. We were always in the office. A lot of our software, we do a lot with financial services companies and big enterprise. And a lot of their technology is deployed on-premise, right? So a lot of it is behind the firewall, not in the cloud, really secure stuff, high availability, like very different, very boutique-focused software platforms. Then when COVID happened, everyone had to go to remote and had to go to the cloud and had to do all these things. We had to retool our stack from a tech perspective, which we did successfully. But then we also had to refactor how we talked to customers and like how we worked with them and how we marketed our products. We used to be in the office with them. And then it became like more of a product-led product, product -led marketing activity kind of product and also sales. But it wasn't like always one-to-one -one or white glove kind of sales activity. Makes sense. And when you say product and sales, like you had people reaching out, but then you also were able to have prospects like use the product before. Yeah, it comes down to like the nuts and bolts. It comes down to before, let's say when you're just basically an enterprise software company and you're with a sales team, you'll basically advertise your expertise or your solutions and then you'll say, contact our sales team. All of that had to be retooled where it was, Here's our products. Here's our technology our expertise. Oh, you can sign up and try the product right here. Like that whole funnel and workflow of the standard SaaS website where it's like product, features, pricing, login. Like that's how the website looks when you build it. It's like up in the upper right hand corner is the login button. We had to build all of that for some of our products. So where you could just go to our website, sign up for a product and use it, which was a very different approach than we used to have. And how are you driving the traffic to the website? So that was interesting during COVID, right? I think everybody and their brother woke up and started using LinkedIn. Like you know, LinkedIn was dormant and then COVID happened. And everyone's like, LinkedIn is where we are now, right? A lot of it was some LinkedIn ads, a lot of LinkedIn content, right? So we were doing content marketing on LinkedIn, either evangelizing the use of the type of technology that we had, evangelizing our products, or just building the brand. So I think I was posting like two or three LinkedIn videos a day for myself personally. Nice like building like my personal brand. And then it was a lot of sticky marketing and content marketing on that channel. I'm mainly focused on LinkedIn. Nice. With the company you bootstrapped or did you raise money? We bootstrapped it. From the cash that we made from, from setting all the software at the previous company. Yeah, and then also using those same customers. Because Kumu had a bad management structure at the top, they weren't really paying attention and we were able to take their customers and bootstrap from that and go. And when I say take their customers, their customers came to us and said, can you solve this? Do you have a product for it? And we were like, there's a need here. Let's start building. Oh, interesting. So the idea for Bunch came out of conversations whilst at Kumi. And we also licensed software back to... Oh, really nice. Listen, it is like the Michael Jordan of legal for a, a current employee that's a salesperson to start their own company, write their own software, but then license the software back to the company they work for. But we pulled it off. But sales cures all. So if you ever hear someone say that, oh, sales cures all, that's really true. If you can go get the deal, put it together, bring the money and the revenue, people will say, okay, yeah, we'll do this. We'll let you do whatever you want. And 
I had a lot of lateral freedom. And I think that's a very politically correct way to say I could do whatever I wanted in that company. So I assume you needed some technical co-founders as well for Bunch. Did you also bring them over from Kumu or did you know them from elsewhere? Uh, I was blessed. I've got a really good friend, John Ware, and we still work together. He's the CTO at Goodfoot. We both do some business there together. I pulled him in and he is ex-tech stars guy, like really, really high level thinker, really, really smart. I would say if I want to categorize him, he's like the visionary CEO, CTO. If you look at his worst fault is that he's too early. He was doing machine learning and chat GPT stuff like five years ago before the bubbles. And he typically knows where the technology is moving. So yeah, we had him. So him and I together, you have two really good pillars of like sales and tech. We were able to do some magic. And then obviously the marketing that you were driving first. Yeah, yeah. I think when it became, we would dabble in them. That was like the first times I got into things like product led marketing or just having to write my own B2B marketing, right? Like do all the different pieces. I would do them first and say, okay, this is decent, but not as good as it could be. Then I'd hire a copywriter. Okay, this looks okay. Then I'd hire a graphic designer. Then we'd hire marketing resource number three. But at least I understood what they were doing. And I think that's the key to being successful. Yeah, I feel like sales is like also the key to being successful. The more and more I progress in my career, the more I realize that skill set is just so powerful. I remember shying away from it earlier in my career because it used to be like not, I don't know, people would maybe look down at you if you were a salesperson. But now I regret not getting into it early. Yeah, Kirsten Knipp, she's, I think she's the CEO of Ask Nicely right now, but she's an ex-MIT grad and then she used to work at HubSpot and she's a venture partner. She's always been like 10 steps ahead of me. Super smart woman. I remember one time I was, I told her I was going into enterprise software sales and she said, she was like, yeah, sales is never bad to have on your resume. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll stay in sales because this super smart person that's good in our industry is telling me that's good to have. Sales is one, it teaches resolve, but two, makes you very adaptable. I don't know. If you're in marketing, you should go try to sell something. And then you'll understand, oh, here's all the challenges that a salesperson has when they're talking to someone. Let me augment my marketing or change my marketing to be different. You'll just understand the role better. And I would say maybe... If you're in sales, I don't know how beneficial it'll be for you to go do a day in a marketer's shoes, but understand their process. Again, flat organization, no silos, really fixes a lot of problems. So Bunch was sold mid of last year. What have you been doing since and what are your plans for the coming years? It's a super interesting conversation. Some of it I can't talk about because I am working on a few things that are really interesting. So first of all, once the acquisition happened, you get some golden handcuffs where you have to stick around for a while to get the rest of your money. So we're doing that. And I'm leading... How long is it? Is that one year, five years? I'll probably be done with it this year. I don't know. It doesn't have a specific expiration date. I'm coming up on the anniversary of that one year. So I think you'll see that. I'm, right now, I'm doing enterprise streaming for Uniguest, which is cool. They have a lot of good products under their portfolio. And I'm helping them bring that enterprise streaming platform to market. That's one activity. There are a lot of interesting things to do once you have a track record. Once you start a company from nothing, build a bunch of value, then sell it, you have a track record of being able to do that and then you get some options. And I think that's really interesting for me right now. I'll evaluate a few options. Because if much easier for you to open doors, ETC, DC, stuff you can't share. Yeah, but I'm sure when you can, you'll share on your LinkedIn profile and we can all see. Yeah, it'll be another scale-up, startup move. Right. It'll be something I think I've really found a niche there where emerging technology, bringing things to market, high growth companies. I'm not a person that's, I don't want to work in a big matrix company with 15 bosses. So all the big companies are out for me. Right. I like to move quick. I like to have a lot of lateral freedom. My biggest thing is being creative, being able to create new products, new offerings. So it'll be something in that scale up and startup realm, right? That size of bringing some video technology to market. And that's the market I've been working in for quite some time. And do you think it would be as you like founding something again? Founding or operating as an early operator, for sure. Once you get hooked on that, it's hard to not do that. So if you start a company, and you're the kind of person that likes to start a company, or you're a kind of person that is working at a big company, but likes to create new products or doesn't like a lot of bureaucracy, man, you can't go back because it'll drive you crazy. 
it will drive you absolutely crazy. You can't go back. That's the best way I can say it. If you have a lot of freedom today working at a scale up or a startup, and then you go try to work at IBM, just doing an expense report will crush your soul. I don't know. What's your experience? Where have you worked and what are you doing now? What's your experience in the background? Yeah, I did note that you have a, a one year slot at IBM. My background, I did two years at EY, two years at Accenture. Okay. And then I've done okay. like 10 years of entrepreneurship. And so I do not think I'd ever be able to be employed again. I'm not that good at being employed. And hopefully right. I'll get to the point where I won't be like forced into being employed. Yeah, you know what the hell I'm talking about then. ENY, Accenture, that's mega process, spreadsheet. You're not walking in with your MacBook and your latte. You're basically having to fill out forms and do those kinds of processes and procedures. I spent a year at IBM, for sure. And it wasn't bad. What I'll tell you this is I learned early on how to work through a matrix organization. I learned how to work with big companies and I learned the mechanics of how big companies do business together. And I'm sure you learned that at ENY. I'm sure you learned that at Accenture. Like you understand the mechanisms, how those big companies work with each other. And there's some deals being a startup you can't get unless you're at an IBM or something. So IBM doesn't innovate. They just acquire, right? When I worked at IBM, it was like boot camp education. It was like the basics. You learn these basics. And listen, I, I think it was valuable. I think my time at IBM was great. Some people spend their whole career there. I could only be there a year. And then I was like, I have to move on because I felt like there was, I had too much of a leash on me. Makes sense. Well, I'm very excited to see what comes next. We'll link to your LinkedIn profile below. Anything else we should mention or link to? Watch this space. I'm going to do something interesting. Based on our conversation, I think to close it out, if you're in marketing and you listen to this whole podcast, Bravo to you. But if you're in marketing, go on a sales call every week with your best and your worst salespeople. Learn something from the field. Bring it back to your marketing and understand why people buy things. Understand the language they use when they talk about the problem or your product. And I think that will completely change your perspective on creating collateral or outreach. And the last thing I'll say, if you're a CEO of a company or you're a CMO, whatever you're judged on, throw it out the window. The sales team number is your number. And if the sales team doesn't hit their number, it's your fault. Just as much as it's their fault. And if you look at it that way, you'll probably work differently. Like you'll only invest in things that make money. You'll only invest in the right marketing activities. You'll think twice about spending a quarter million dollars going to a trade show. Because you're like, is this going to make at least a quarter million dollars in sales. I don't think marketing people think that today. So if you go do those things in the leadership and the execution side, I think it'll change for the better. And we'll end on that. Yeah, for the better. Robert, thank you so much for coming on. Cool, man. Talk to you soon. All right, team, what do we think about that? I think the two big takeaways Robert shared, which I think critical is for the marketing team or ideally the marketing leader to be attending sales calls regularly taking learnings from these and feeding that back into the marketing. And the second is, like we do at Fame, I think the marketing team should have the same goal, whether it's revenue, number of new customers or new clients, as the sales team. And that is, in theory, going to immediately eradicate a whole load of marketing tasks that we're doing that have no direct impact on revenue. So those were the insights. Big shout out to Fame for sponsoring this episode. If you want a show like this, go to fame.so. And of course, thanks to you for listening.